Back in the day when my friends first told me about the movie Basket Case, they were saying how it was just the worst movie they'd ever seen. Bad acting, bad story, bad effects. You know, it's all the hallmarks of a low-budget horror movie. And it sounded like it just had to be. The story of a man and his separated Siamese twin brother go on a killing spree. And then I saw it and it's like, you know, it's pretty cheesy, but I've seen way worse. But furthermore, as a work of art, as a piece of cinema, I'll go so far as to say that this entry from the infamous video Nasty List is actually one of the best of its class. So for today's video, let's take a look at 1982's Basket Case. This video is sponsored by Shudder. Shudder is my favorite streaming service. It's basically the Netflix of horror. The massive selection of thrillers, horror, and suspense right to all of your favorite devices for just $5.99 a month or $56.99 a year. It's a collection that's constantly being updated. For example, this month we have a new season of Cursed Films, which is probably my favorite of all of Shudder's original series. And since in the new season they're going to be covering Cannibal Holocaust, I'm going to make that movie this month's recommendation for you guys. Get started streaming the best horror, thriller, and supernatural content. Shudder's expertly curated collection includes must-see titles like Hellbender, VHS 94, and The Boy Behind the Door, plus all the best horror documentaries and the hit creep show TV series from executive producer Greg Nicotero of The Walking Dead. To try Shudder for free for 30 days, just go to shudder.com and use code WANG. Most versions of Basket Case you'll see these days, including the one that you can watch on Shudder, open with a message that the film is from the collections of the Museum of Modern Art, thereby verifying my claim from the intro that this is a fantastic piece of cinema. But the reason is that in 2017, the MoMA preserved and restored the film to be a part of their permanent film archive. When director Frank Henenlotter was contacted about this, he asked them if they had actually watched the film. As a matter of fact, they did watch the film, and now you can thank the MoMA for the higher quality version of this film that exists now. Even better, considering that he said that he didn't think this movie would ever actually be seen, and he was horrified at its success. Anyway, the movie begins. Dr. Liftlander leaves his house late at night, only to realize he's being watched by someone in the bushes who has asthma. So he rushes back inside to call the police, but he's distracted by crawling inside of his ceiling as the phone lines cut, as well as the power. Oh God, no, no! It's okay though, he's got a gun, which he proceeds to shoot at a shadow while rotating as if he had tank controls. Wastes all his bullets, leans up against the wall, and when you see a still shot like this in a horror movie, you know something's about to jump into that frame, and there it is. A big rubber hand pulling his face down the crotch level for a little... <laughs> comes back up with slices to his nose, lip, and jowls, and it gets brought down for seconds as blood shoots all over the folder and gun, which he surprisingly, in the middle of all of this, had the wherewithal to neatly place down on his desk. Cut to Times Square, back when it was cool and full of titties. Dwayne Bradley, a tall skinny man dressed like Eric Foreman in a Ronald McDonald wig, carries a wicker basket through the streets as a miniature version of Carl Weathers tries to sell him drugs. You know what though, I'll take that over guys in Elmo costumes any day. He comes across Hotel Broslin, managed by an after hours Super Mario who talks the way Super Mario ought to talk. 20 bucks a night, in advance, and if you pay by the day, it's due at noon. And I don't want no junkies in here because this is a respectable hotel. So Dwayne gets himself a room, pays for it with a fat wad of cash that he just happened to have in his pocket catching the attention of resident drunk O'Donovan. Because you know, if you got a resident drunk in your building, he's got to be named O something. Did you see that? He's loaded. So are you. Worth noting too that supposedly this fat wad of cash was actually the film's entire budget. As Dwayne goes to his room, he meets the cast of characters that populate this hotel, which somehow simultaneously reminds me of both Street Trash and Hey Arnold. Two things that I never thought would ever be mentioned in the same breath for any reason. Dwayne asks Super Mario where he can find some food, and then he comes back to his room, armed with two big bags of hamburgers. He opens up his basket, revealing that there's a creature in there for him to feed. First without the bun, then he says fuck keto and gives him the whole thing with the bun, and then you know what, give him the foil too because the burger peel is full of minerals. He then goes through the bloody folder from Dr. Liftlander's office, in case there was any mistake that he was in fact the one that killed him at the beginning. 
After a night of Dwayne's creature keeping him up with a telepathic conversation, Casey, the resident hooker with a heart of gold, keeps the local drunk from stealing Dwayne's wad of cash and invites him to get drinks later. But there's no time for that now. Dwayne and his magical box creature need to pay a visit to one Dr. H. Needleman. And now it's time for my favorite part of every classic New York City horror movie. A woman with a crazy old school New York City accent that kinda sounds like the guy from Altered Beast. So the drugstore said he never should have prescribed it to me in the first place. It's the wrong drug! He should have never prescribed it to me. <laughs> As this conversation's going on, Dwayne gives the receptionist the sex eyes. Especially after she makes these sound effects. Sharon, the receptionist, makes fast friends with Dwayne after she confuses him with the typewriter repairman, and she volunteers to be Dwayne's tour guide. Look at this guy, he's got his Ken Patera haircut, he's got a Wizard of Oz Toto basket, he just rolls into town and women are throwing themselves at him. Here you are, alone on a Friday night, watching YouTube. Keep doing that though, I like getting views. Now it's time for Dwayne to meet Dr. Needleman. A greasy, weasel-like man scarfing down some crusty old pizza that's finger looking good. He immediately demands Dwayne take his shirt off for examination, and everything about this guy's demeanor just makes him seem like he's not really a doctor, he's a guy pretending to be a doctor. Like he's got the energy of that kid who pretended to be a gynecologist. His excitement to see a shirtless man, though, turns to horror as he sees Dwayne's massive scar that's made of Play-Doh. The examination's over pretty quickly, so Dwayne makes some plans with Sharon, and he goes to a movie theater with his basket where he dozes off watching a movie of the greatest Chinese sounds you've ever heard in your life. And while he's out, some guy takes his basket because you know it's New York City and people are just gonna take your shit if you ain't watching it. Luckily though, the basket has a built-in security system. Later that night, a sweaty needleman calls up one Dr. J. Cutter, who's in full cougar mode, seducing what appears to be a young stage magician. This woman gives off very powerful Mary Barrows energy, like if they ever made a Clock Tower movie. Or if, you know, they ever finished that one that's been in development since 2008 with six different screenwriters and 11 different producers. Needleman informs her about Dwayne's visit and that he told him that he's the one who killed Dr. Lifflander. Cut him in half. Cutter doesn't really care though, you know, how fucking dare this greasy man interrupt her dick appointment. And with that phone call ending, Dr. Needleman's fate is sealed. Dwayne sneaks back into his office late at night, dumps the creature named Belial out of the basket onto the floor Jake the Snake style. Needleman tries to barricade himself in, but he's fucked as we finally get our first full glimpse of the creature, a scrotal soup dumpling blob with the face of a man and ribs and organs visible through his skin actually creepy as fuck for what it is. I mean, can you imagine just being face to face with that thing in a hallway? It's worth noting that Belial's face here is actually made with a cast of Dwayne's actor Kevin Van Hettenrich's face, because they wanted to make them look related. He also performed the creature's vocalizations. Anyhow, the horror of this creepy face is immediately done away with as Dr. Needleman tussles with the creature like a 1990s wrestling buddy. He meets his end as the creature squeezes his belly rolls to death, releasing the sweet, sweet jelly within. So hard that he's eventually cut in half. It's a great success, so Belial is rewarded with a treat of raw hot dogs. And at this point, you have to wonder, this creature in the basket, he's living on a diet of hamburgers and hot dogs, a lot of them. You know this thing's taking crazy shits. And he's in a basket most of the day. You'd assume that, just, you know, the basket would be full of shit at some point. I don't really, I don't really think this thing cares that much about hygiene, so it's just gonna let him loose, right? And yet the basket looks clean to me. Can you say plot hole? But I digress. Dwayne leaves the creature with a TV for entertainment, which it instantly breaks when it tries to change the channel. And Dwayne goes on his hot date with Sharon. The date goes pretty well. But the creature, as we've seen before, has a telepathic connection with Dwayne. He's not happy about this. He's watching all this in his mind, and you know, as far as I can tell, this thing's got no dick. I'd be mad too. No matter how goofy it looks, there's always something very nostalgic to me about stop motion. I get bummed sometimes thinking about how it's so rare to see anymore, especially because it's so expensive and time consuming. It's just a job that CG can do a lot more easily, and so it usually does. I wonder though, if you didn't grow up with stop motion, it probably just looks like some stupid bullshit to you. So the ruckus that this creature stirs up while having its temper tantrum tracks everyone in the hotel up there until a sneaky fuck slips back into this basket, leaving everyone puzzled about what made this huge mess. I don't know man, must have been a raccoon. 
That old drunk O'Donovan, though, can't help himself but sneak back in and grab that money. But you know, if Dwayne's got all that money just sitting out, surely he's got even more in that basket. But of course, there's no money in that basket. It's Belial, and O'Donovan gets his face touched to death. And let me tell you, that psychic connection, it'll cock block you every time. Dwayne, sensing that something terrible has happened, runs back to the hotel, abandoning Sharon, who follows him all the way there. And after the examination, Dr. Needleman must have told her that he has a monster cock, because... She chased him all the way from the Statue of Liberty to Times Square. That's over four miles. It didn't even break a sweat doing it. When Dwayne gets back to his room, a detective investigating the murder questions him. He wants to see what's inside that basket, which of course we all know is... Nothing? Turns out Belial was hiding in the toilet all along, and seeing as how Dwayne gives him a bit of privacy, I guess that answers the shit question. Plot hole closed. Dwayne assures Belial that there's no hanky-panky as the puppet sits there motionless with a weirdly judgmental look on its face. So after all the craziness, Dwayne has to wind down, so he goes to a bar where he runs into Casey. It's worth noting that originally Casey was supposed to have a much smaller role in the movie, but Frank Henelotter liked her performance so much that he made the role bigger, and he would go on to feature her in all of his subsequent films. She would also go on to make her own live show as the character 30 years later. So they down a few of those classic cans of Budweiser, and the truth comes out. He tells her that the creature in the basket, Belial, is his brother. They are separated Siamese twins. I know what you're thinking. Casey was thinking the same thing. That's funny, you don't look oriental! <laughs> I know people find the term oriental to be really offensive, but whenever I hear about it, I just think about, you know, some guy wearing one of those Gohan hats and is carrying bags of exotic spices. After telling Casey all their business, he passes out drunk and has a flashback where we see what happened from the very beginning, the day of their birth. Their father is reasonably upset that his wife died during childbirth, and also that one of his sons is basically a boglin. Jump 12 years into the future, their aunt is homeschooling them, and we get a glimpse of how they looked when they were still attached as kids. Belial kind of just looks like a big oatmeal cookie with eyes here. Or maybe he does and I'm just hungry while writing this script. I don't even know anymore. One night while their aunt was away, the boy's father sneaks in a team of three doctors to perform a separation procedure that will most likely kill Belial. And the boys watch as this whole thing is discussed. Even the doctors express their concern about it, but as their father puts it, It's better off dead. What kind of life would it have the way it is? We're talking about your child. Child? Dwayne is my child, not that other thing. And the scene where they actually performed the procedure is weirdly squirmy to me. Like you've got probably the goofiest version of Belial that we see in the movie. He's all wet and sweaty and being shaken around. But something about watching them stick the needle into the obviously fake thing, I'm still like, eh. But of course, though, any tension from this is gone. As soon as the medicine hits and he passes out like a Looney Tunes. <laughs> like, he's just like, uh. <laughs> and then as Dr. Cutter is getting to cutting, it's making fucking Mario paint eraser noises. After the procedure, Dwayne wakes up horrified that his brother is gone, but... Belial communicates to him telepathically. Gotta find him out in the woods, wrapped up in a garbage bag. Seeing him move around in the garbage bag mixed with the music that's playing, it actually made me feel kind of bad for the little Boglin. As the little things like that, that to me make this movie, uh, another cut above most shitty horror movies like this. And then it's time for the boys to get their revenge. The father wakes up to the sound of Wily e. Coyote construction noises. And the boys put their homeschool-enriched brains to good use. They built a little buzzsaw battle bot with the express purpose of cutting their dad in half. Just like he did to them. Poetic justice. Their aunt, always a real one, hides them from the cops and keeps taking care of the boys until the day she dies. Just before the movie begins. Back to the present, Dwayne and Casey drunkenly stumble back to the hotel. And with Dwayne knocked out, Casey takes a moment to check inside the basket and see if that whole story was for real. And you know what? There's nothing in there. I guess he must have been pulling her leg. No wait, actually, Belial was lurking around, waiting for his chance to make his move. Dwayne got some action, now it's his turn. Whatever was in there is gone. No! It's alright, no. nobody stay with me tonight. I'm sorry. Considering that it's only been hours since a man in the hotel got his face touched to death, Everyone seems really quick to decide that Casey was just imagining things. This isn't a hotel, it's a house! In any case, though, Belial got away with a consolation prize. Some used panties. 
just hotboxing that basket with pussy fumes. And now it's finally time for the brothers to finish what they started. They pull up to the office of Dr. Cutter, who they learn is actually a veterinarian. So Dwayne has Dr. Cutter take a look at his cat. So, tell me about your cat. You said on the phone he's badly cut. Yes, on his side. Okay, let's take him into the next room. He very quickly gives up on this ruse though and name drops Dr. Lifflander. Let's take a look at him. Only it's not a cat. I thought you and said... And I think I should explain how he got his cut before you see him. Another vet, Dr. Lifflander, operated on him upstate unsuccessfully. Dr. Lifflander. Yes, you know him? Cutter very clearly now knows who Dwayne is and after a brief exchange, tells him to get the fuck out. But she can't help herself, she just gotta see what's in that basket. What's in the basket? <laughs> and so, Belial bites her on the neck while literally making om nom nom noises. <laughs> then he gives her a fucking mandible claw, cuts her tongue open, causing her to basically make the exact sound of Grape Lady. <laughs> She tries to fight back by grabbing a scalpel from her drawer, but that doesn't work out and Belial slowly lowers her face into the drawer of sharp objects. And this is a rare case where I think cutting away at the point of impact actually made the scene better. You know, something I hear people say a lot with horror movies is that if you have uh, some kind of impact and you cut away at the time of the impact or the time of the kill or whatever the fuck, that it makes it more horrific because your brain fills it in with something worse than what the actual shot could have been. In my opinion, that mentality is usually bullshit. But in this scenario, just because of the pure logistics of shooting a person's face going into a drawer, I don't think there would have been a better way to do this. And then after the boys make their escape, the nurses find Dr. Cutter. They turn that bitch into a Cenobite. So that's it, the boys got their revenge, now what? Sharon finds Dwayne returning to his room to tell him about how her boss was murdered, and she needs him to comfort her. Sigma male grind tip, murder her boss so she'll sleep with you. So they're getting down to it and this fucking guy Belial starts screaming right in the middle of the titty touch, ruins everything. Dwayne wraps Sharon up in the blanket and throws her out into the hallway, and she's still starving for it. This woman just had sex interrupted by a creature that should have irreparably damaged her psyche after gazing upon it like some kind of Lovecraftian protagonist. And she still wants that dick. Well, the best I could do for you is his brother. So after some kind of magic psychic eyeball link up thing, Dwayne dreams that he's running naked to Sharon's apartment. Note that for this scene they had no permits and it was cold as fuck. So basically they drive around looking for an empty street, clear it of debris so he didn't step on anything. And then they drop him off to run naked up the block. He gets to the end of the block, they pick him up in a heated van, and they do it over again until they get enough footage. And of course, as I'm sure you figured out, this isn't just the dream. This is in fact Belial making his way to Sharon's apartment while tapped into Dwayne's mind. Now it's his turn to touch a titty. And feet. Of course the subhuman blob is also a foot guy. Dwayne awakens, realizing what's happening, and rushes to Sharon's apartment as fast as he can. But it's too late. She wakes up, horrified to see Belial on top of her. So, he touches her neck and face until she somehow dies. And Dwayne walks in just in time to see Belial humping her corpse. With no time to spare, he packs up Belial in the basket, fights with them the whole way back to the hotel, swinging and yelling at the basket about how he ruined everything and he's gonna kill him. When they get back to the room, the other hotel guests watch in horror as Belial lifts Dwayne up by his dick and they fall out the window, just hanging on the sign for dear life. Ah! Oh, what's that? Oh, girls, look at that. What is that? Oh, no. Hey, are you okay up there? But the power of hamburgers and hot dogs were not enough, and eventually Belial loses his grip, making them both fall to their deaths. Or did they? Honestly, I really like this movie. I think a lot of the times people present it to you as a so bad that it's good movie, but honestly, if you're watching it for that reason, there's better options. Yeah, there's some goofy effects and some zany moments, but in my opinion, the acting and production are never bad enough to make it funny. But the characters in this movie are so much more fully fleshed out than other movies like it. Just the whole world in general is so much more full and alive than you usually experience with this kind of thing. Like, even the side characters are more than just cannon fodder. And it really comes across how Belial, despite everything, is actually human. 
and he would like to be able to live a normal life like anyone else, but that's simply not possible. And he resents the fact that his brother could potentially live a normal life. I think a lesser movie would have taken this setup and just had to be like, hey, you got these crazy monster twins, they're killing people. I definitely recommend watching this movie just because I think it's a good movie, but don't watch it expecting over-the-top hilarity. But anyway, it's all for now. If you like this video, check out my video about the Chinese guy who ate a baby. Or did he?